How much did they give you? Uh, two hundred dollars in cash and the bag of these. I think they're Canadian or from Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know. <laughs> they're golden drachmas. Dollars are for the human world, and drachmas are for the mythic world. I brought you this. No, well, it's definitely interesting. Maya. Well, it's definitely interesting. It was a gift from my dad. You know I was gonna pick you before I chose Grover. Hey, Grover's a lot better at making segments than people think. I was afraid. If I have a chance to save Aftershock, I can't let anything stop me. And I'm afraid if it gets in the way of Quest, Annabeth might try to, and you said you've always been on her side, hey, so... Hey, it's okay. Really. I... I get it. Just take care of each other out there. Coming up on this week's episode of Aftershock... Samantha highlights our soccer game. Our reporters show us a school event. Emma rates Girl Scout cookies, and much, much more. I'm Mariana Sanin, and I'm Giovanna Sheldon, and this episode of Aftershock starts now. Goodness, it isn't raining. Imagine having to film tosses outside. Yeah, but some places don't have the luxury of moving inside when the sun goes out. Here's Brian to tell us more about these events. On a rainy day like this, most people are inside, which is why it might be confusing to find a sign leading to a car show with just one car. So today I decided to speak with its owner to see what this was all about. Hey, my name is Dirk Dijon. There's a, a, a group, a club, it's called the Antique Automobile Club of America, and it's um, over 50 years old in the Fort Lauderdale area. We have about 90 members now. We all have different cars that we collect and we take to different shows and stuff. Unfortunately, the weather did not cooperate with us today, but we try to do a show at least once a month. So you're getting together with your friends and your buddies, you know, and you're sharing stories about cars. And it's a lot of fun. Plus, we do a lot for the community, too. But at the end of the day, a car show can't be a car show without a car. Yeah, that car is interesting. I bought it out of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and the gentleman I bought it from, he was able to give me all the documentation, and I was able to get the original buyer's order. So it was kind of neat to have a one-owner car with low mileage. People have relationship with cars, you know, like when I was a kid, I remember, you know, driving a car, and my grandpa used to have a car like that. And as the cars get older, they're also like, moving art. When cars were designed and built, they were done in studios and you would have a guy who did interior pieces, another person do the outside and put them all together. It was really big for art and so that's, it's like a rolling billboard of art which is kind of neat. I'm Brian Baumfim, CBTV.
What's up, Cypress Bay? I'm Emma Lovkman. And I'm Madison Turner. And today, we're diving into a tasteful debate. That's right, we're rating Girl Scout cookies. Now, let's dive in. Oh my god. I'll put them in like a middle for right now. I've heard these are really good. <laughs> Why are they? <laughs> I'm so excited. Classic. It's a cookie. It's just a regular sugar. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. This is the best one. Oh, I still taste the other one. Oh my god, girl. No, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. <laughs> this is one right here. No! Oh, no! <laughs> no! This is the number one, but agree to disagree. I'm Emma Luckman. And I'm Madison Turner. CB TV. An estimated 1.4 million people suffer from Crohn's disease. Our reporters highlight a person who brings awareness to this issue. Okay, so my name is Jordan Lustig. I'm a part of SVA, and that's kind of how I like got this walk started and like bringing awareness to Crohn's and IBS. Through SGA, I was able to organize this, and Ms. Nelson-Mensco helped me a lot. And yeah, it was a really great experience. So the event that happened today was a Crohn's and IBS awareness walk. And the main goal of today was just to bring awareness to Crohn's disease specifically. This year I decided to include IBS because that's kind of like a wider scale, like more people have IBS than Crohn's. I was diagnosed in 2021 and it's just been a passion of mine to bring awareness to the disease. I started having pain in my stomach after mostly dinner because that was like the biggest meal I had that day. Usually we did like family walks around the block because it was COVID. And after a couple of these meals, I wasn't able to walk. So I just had to kind of like sit on the couch, wait for them to get back. And at first, you know, like people were just like, oh, sensitive stomach, like that's probably what it is. So for about a couple of months, maybe like five, I was just in a lot of pain. I couldn't really walk after I ate. And then finally, my mom was like, we'll do a telehealth because it was COVID. So I didn't really go to see a doctor. And they said that they wanted to do some blood work. And I obviously had never done any blood work before. I usually do finger pricks. So that was so scary for me. I went, I almost passed out, like very scary. And then in the procedure, they found ulcers in my stomach. I think I had about six. So they wanted to get another procedure in, pill cam, just make sure that what they were seeing was Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease is in your small intestines. And I had it both in my small and big. So the importance of these blocks is just to bring awareness about the disease. Crohn's disease has no cure. And a lot of people don't really know about the disease. And you know, we can't fundraise if people don't know. We can't really like help the foundation. So there's a Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and they raise the money. They have kind of like members and communities and those people like will raise awareness for it. And then that helps like research and funding and eventually hoping to find a cure.
Smile with Sports. What's up, Cypress Bay? I'm Maya Wolf, and March is finally upon us, so you know what that means? March Madness season. Here's Mariana to tell us all about it. Whether you're a basketball fanatic or not, March Madness is a nation-known tournament. What's up, Cypress Bay? I'm Mariana Sanin, and I'm here to tell you what March Madness has in store for us this year. For those who don't know what it is, NCAA March Madness is a single elimination tournament played in the United States to determine the men's college basketball national champion of the Division I level in the National Collegiate Athletic Association. Now that you have some background knowledge, let's begin with this year's predictions. For the Big Ten, projections of the final tournament field reveal a larger truth. The conference hasn't been quite as strong this season as it has been in recent years. Even with an upset loss on the road last Sunday against Ohio State, number three Purdue is still among the top contenders for the national title. But beyond the Boilmakers, there is just one Big Ten team ranked in the USA Today Sports Coaches Poll, and number 12, Illinois. Wisconsin is sliding with five losses in its past six games, which is reflected in its seeding in the most recent bracket update. Michigan State is surging with eight wins in its past 10 games, but the Spartans' lackluster 9-7 start to the season may limit just how high they can rise. Northwestern and Nebraska are both in the field, but as double-digit seeds. The Badgers mercifully ended a four-game losing streak on February 13th with a win against Ohio State that indirectly led to the ouster of Buckeyes coach Chris Holtman. From there, though, they squandered an opportunity to generate some much-needed momentum. Falling in overtime on the road against a middling Iowa team in the game in which they shot just 37% from the field in the second half. Whatever the Badgers are enduring right now, the Spartans are experiencing the opposite. Michigan State is coming together at the right time, with three consecutive victories and won both of its games last week, defeating Penn State on the road 80-72 before knocking off bitter rival Michigan for the second time this season. Coach Tom Izzo's team is comfortably off the bubble. Last week was a mixed bag for the Wildcats, who narrowly fell on the road against the Rutgers, before beating a reeling Indiana team in Assembly Hall on Sunday. Northwestern's metrics aren't quite as impressive as its records, but it still has a 4-5 record in Quad 1 games. If it gets too close to the bubble, though a home loss from December against lowly Chicago State could prove to be costly. Taking account into all of this, it is believed that the Purdue Boilmakers and UConn Huskies will fall on top in the NCAA March Madness Tournament. I'm Mariana Sanin, CB TV. Even though the Super Bowl has passed, one of the most iconic parts of the night always remains in our heads. The Halftime Show. Here's Samantha to give us a little history of the annual tradition. After this year's Super Bowl, it's safe to say that these games are truly unpredictable. However, one almost guarantee is that there will be some elaborate halftime performance. But it actually hasn't always been this way. What's up, Cypress Bay? I'm Samantha Rosenzweig, and we're going to be looking at the history of Super Bowl performances. Starting back at Super Bowl I in 1967, halftime performances were just a way to fill the time and entertain the fans during the team's much-needed break. Much of high school and college breaks, it was composed of a band. The University of Arizona's band amused the crowd by forming shapes of the country, a paddle boat, and the Liberty Bell. However, this didn't stay for long, as by Super Bowl IV in 1970, Broadway and movie star Carol Channing became the first solo halftime performer. She had performed Where the Saints Go Marching In and was joined by the Southern University Band. These exciting shows truly gained popularity when NBC was determined to keep viewers and create a show that could not be ignored. So in 1993 at Super Bowl 27, they decided on the biggest star in music, Michael Jackson, to headline. This king of pop gave a show that was high energy and full of feel-good moments, especially in his finale, filled with 3,500 local children and teens. From then on, only megastars would grace the field with their tunes and something special. Everyone from Stevie Wonder to Timberlake and Janet to Prince and his guitar would perform. Though they got even more extravagant in the more recent years with Madonna and the sack line, Lady Gaga falling from the top of the NRG Stadium, and my personal favorite, Katy Perry and the Dancing Sharks. 
Super Bowl performances have come a long way since the beginning and they are talked about even as much as the games. I wonder who it'll be next year, even though I'm hoping for Taylor Swift. I'm Sammy Rosenzweig, CB TV. And that's all for this week's Lightning Athletics. I'm Maya Wolf, CBTV Sports. What's up, Cypress Bay? I'm Luisa, and today I'm going to be asking the Bay controversial questions. What are your thoughts on pineapple on pizza? It's fire. I love it. You can have, it's like, it's unhealthy to eat pizza, right? But pineapple is also good, so it equals it out, so it would be like healthy to eat it. No. It's awful, and if you like it, I hope you have a bad day today. I hope you have a bad day today. I like pineapple pizza. Yeah. I think it adds a taste of like sweet. I hope you have a bad day today. I don't know. No, like no, like no. Like it, it shouldn't be a thing. Like no. You gotta be psycho. You gotta be sick. In the morning, do you put milk first or cereal first? Into your Are you crazy? Cereal. If you're, a, I'm sorry to say this, Cypress, but if you put your milk before your cereal, you're a weird person. Definitely the milk. Milk definitely goes first. <laughs> Both. At the same time? Like, shh. Yeah, like at the same time. Like, shh. Oh. The cereal! Cereal, then milk, but if you're having a second round, then I'll, I'll, I'll be fine with putting the cereal in the milk. Like, if you're so hungry, you know, like you have to dump the cereal in the rest of the milk. Okay, what do you guys like better, cats or dogs? I have to go with dogs. Cat, definitely. I have a dog. I'm a dog. Are, are. Um, I'm a bit of a baby. I'm scared of animals. So, but I have to pick dogs. I've been attacked by cats. I adopted a cat once. It attacked me and then I returned it to the shelter. Yeah, that's a true story. Anyways. Well, you guys' answers were interesting. I'm Lisa Hernandez, CBTV. And that's all for this week's episode of Aftershock. If you'd like to watch previous episodes, check out our YouTube channel at Cypress Bay CBTV and follow us on all social medias. I'm Giovanna Sheldon. I'm Mariana Sanin. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.